On today's program, I interview Melanie Windridge. Melanie Windridge is a British plasma physicist and science communicator, best known for her book, Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights. In this presentation, we'll talk about the Northern Lights, the science, her journey in discovering the beauty of the Northern Lights. Enjoy the program, like the show, comment below, and thank you for listening. Melanie Windridge, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Melanie, before I ask you what causes the Northern Lights, what are some of the best of the worst explanations you've heard? <laughs> oh, well, there are actually explanations that, that go back quite a long way. And what's was quite interesting about uh, researching my book is that I was able to find out uh, some of these different explanations. And there's actually this period where it goes from the, expl the scientific explanations actually are uh, like indistinguishable from the mythology because in the past people used to think that maybe the aurora was fire in the sky or it was reflections from ice or volcanoes or you know those those kind of things were in in the old stories and there was a period where the scientific explanations kind of became those those sort of descriptions as well and it was only in about well late 1800s early 1900s that people started coming up with, like, let's say, more plausible explanations for what causes the Northern Lights. Give us like two or three examples of uh, some of the bad explanations for the Northern Lights. Okay, so I suppose the thing that bothers me the most is when people say that the aurora is caused by charged particles from the sun, which come down magnetic field lines and they hit our atmosphere, and that causes the aurora. And actually, it's kind of similar to what happens and the like the first real plausible explanation of, of what causes the lights was given by Christian Birkeland in the early 1900s and that's essentially what he says charged particles coming down magnetic field lines but really it's it's not so much about where the particles are, are coming from it's not that they come directly from the sun they don't they're actually accelerated from within our magnetic environment and this is caused by an interaction of the solar wind which is charged particles from the sun uh, which interact with our magnetic field and this is what kind of pumps it up adds in lots of energy and accelerates charged particles down the field lines and there they interact with the atmosphere and cause the aurora so I'd say the bad explanation there is missing out the acceleration. The process of, the, of acceleration is, is critical to the aurora that we see. We just wouldn't see the bright aurora displays in the nighttime that we see without that process of acceleration. And yet so many places miss it out. Why do we only hear about the aurora borealis? There are the southern lights as well, no? Yes, there are the aurora australis. We don't hear about it so much, I think, just because people don't see it so much. That's just because there aren't really so many people down there. So in the south, uh, the, the auroral oval, which is the ring where we most often see the aurora, that goes through a bit of Antarctica and mostly it goes through sea. And so there's just nobody down there to see the aurora, or, uh, so to see the aurora australis. So sometimes there are scientists at some of the research bases, uh, so they do see the aurora australis. And occasionally, if you get higher activity, then people in New Zealand see the aurora australis as well. But it's it's just like not seen as often as we see it in the north. In the north, the, the oval goes right around um, over land, over Canada, over Alaska, northern Scandinavia, Iceland. So loads of people see the aurora in the north. Are there southern lights, the Australis, uh, are they just as magnificent? Are they the same or are they different? The Aurora Australis and the Aurora Borealis are the same, pretty much. You might not see exactly the same structures or exactly the same like movement in both hemispheres, but they are caused in the same way. And actually, they should be fairly similar. So if you think about... Uh, the fact that there's some kind of acceleration process happening on the far side of the Earth, away from the sun. So it's like this big catapult going off behind the Earth, and it's accelerating charged particles down the magnetic field lines. And that's why they come into the poles, because the magnetic field lines go in this sort of uh, butterfly wing bar magnet kind of shape. And so they come down the, the magnetic field lines into the poles. And so if you 
set off the catapult like far behind the Earth, it's going to come down the poles evenly, all these charged particles. So you should get kind of similar effects in the northern and the southern hemispheres. The thing is that the atmosphere that they're hitting into, so the screen, if you like, is different because in one hemisphere it's summer and in the other it's winter. So the temperatures are quite different. And this can sometimes affect, uh, you know, what what you see. So scientists actually study this difference because sometimes they see things that are very similar. Other things they see, other times they see things that are quite different. And that points to gaps in their understanding. So you're a plasma physicist. You could be solving the world's energy problems. <laughs> Why focus on the northern lights? Actually, I just focus on the northern lights in my spare time. I do work on solving the world's energy problems. I work for a <laughs> company called Tokamak Energy, which is a small fusion energy startup. And we're trying to accelerate the development of fusion energy, which would be a clean, green, safe and abundant source of energy for the future. So, yeah, fusion energy is kind of my day job, you could say. But uh, I, I really love the outdoors. And I love mountains. I love climbing. I was really attracted to the Arctic as well, like these <clears throat> wild open landscapes. And I think that I just thought it would be really great to study some of that plasma physics in in those other environments that I love, do something to get me out of the lab. And so once I finished my PhD, I became interested in in seeing the aurora and also in visiting the Arctic. So this just it seemed like a perfect combination, although it, it really wasn't that considered. It didn't. I didn't just wake up one morning and think, hey, I'm going to write a book. It just it was like these two interests kind of grew in parallel. And I read up more about polar exploration and learned a bit more about the aurora. And then, yeah, one day it just just sort of seemed like the next step was to go and to find out more. So you've traveled from the Arctic Circle to Scotland, Greenland, I imagine. Actually, not Greenland. I've traveled. So I went to various different locations when I was uh, writing the book, uh, mostly Arctic locations, although Scotland is, is not Arctic. But being British, I thought that it was quite interesting that uh, we don't normally associate the aurora with the UK, but you can actually see the aurora quite frequently from the very far north of uh, Britain. So up in Scotland, the very, very far north of Scotland is at about the same latitude as southern Scandinavia, so places like Oslo. So although they don't see the aurora like all the time, they do see it fairly frequently. And there are a lot of uh, you know, photographers up there who, who do go and chase it. But yeah, I went to places like the first place I went where I first saw the aurora was Sweden. And then I went to northern Norway. I visited Canada in the summer, actually, and um, Iceland as well. And then I finally went to Spitsbergen, to Svalbard. That was the very last journey that I made for the book. And that was part of the, the reason why I wanted to write the, the book in the first place, actually. I really wanted to ski out across Svalbard and experience the aurora in the way the old polar explorers would have done. So that was really part of the driving force and so it was really nice to end the book that way and I saw a total solar eclipse there which was incredible and again another a wonderful way to end the book because it just wraps the whole thing up you know you see the sun and you see this like milky uh, silvery solar wind kind of coming away from the sun during an eclipse and that's what's ultimately causing the aurora so it was lovely. Did you learn anything throughout the journey other like did you learn anything that you didn't expect to learn uh, as far as the science goes? Oh, as far as the science goes, I was going to tell you about personal things that I learned. Um, well, then tell me about the personal things and then we can do science after. OK, I think personally it was, you know, it's like one of these these journeys, isn't it? Like you kind of grow. I didn't mean it to be all cliched like that uh, at all, but I, I really I met some incredible people along the way and one thing I was really humbled by was their generosity. Like people are really, really nice. There were so many people that that I met who just shared things with me, be it their their knowledge or their stories or their friendship or just lots and lots of time. And I think that that was that was something I learned that you know there's there's so much out there and there's some really wonderful people out there that you can meet along the way. And perhaps it made me a bit more adventurous. Oh, not adventurous. Um, yeah, I, I definitely went outside of my comfort zone a little bit 
And I think that's always healthy. <laughs> Helps you to grow, doesn't it? And then scientifically, did you learn anything that you didn't expect? I learned a lot of things on the science side because although I, I'm a plasma physicist, I hadn't studied the aurora before. I'd been working in fusion energy, so it's very lab based and uh, we have a, a particular goal. Uh, we're trying to make energy and uh, and also so although the plasma you know, plasmas can behave in in very in similar ways they're very different length scales like i was looking at plasmas on earth whereas when you're talking about the aurora you've got huge distances between the sun and the earth you've got uh, different plasmas uh, butting up against each other so this plasma of the solar wind comes up against the um the plasma of the, of the earth's magnetosphere so you're learning about completely different things and although i had an awareness of what caused the aurora before i started I learned so much about it, and actually, that, that, yeah, that that's what the book is about. It's about um, you know, how how the aurora happens, and also the history of it. There was so much history that I that I really didn't know, and also the intricacies of the processes that cause the aurora. Uh, as I said before, that process of acceleration is is really fundamental to to causing those bright auroral displays that we see. And actually, I didn't really know about that when I, I started on this journey. All I'd heard was the usual explanation of the charged particles from the sun filtering down field lines. And as I said, that's just not really the case. They, they don't come in directly. It's, it's an indirect process. So I learn about all of these things. Yeah, well, when I, this is why I started the show with asking you what you had heard in terms of bunk science, because when I, mentioned to somebody that uh, we're going to do a show about the northern lights they said oh that's caused by the gases that are released in the atmosphere okay <laughs> yeah so i'm saying nobody really knows what they're talking about yeah and also i think sometimes it depends on how like how much you want to simplify it like i've heard some scientists say yeah well you know it's not quite right but it's kind of okay because you know how much can we expect people to, to understand but I sort of think that's the wrong approach because I want to understand like what it is really. OK, I don't want to make things really complicated. And there are some some really complicated things. You know, you can always dig deeper. It's like fractals. There's always a little bit more um, detail that you can find if you want it. But that doesn't mean that we can miss out a really important process like the acceleration, for example, and pretend it doesn't exist just because it sort of complicates the picture a little bit. I think that it's important to to make sure the basics are there. Just my view. <laughs> Are they dangerous? Like if you were to fly through a storm, would it be dangerous? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, we, I think it depends on, it depends on, no, let's start again. Uh, no, it's not really dangerous, but it, it depends on how much exposure you have to it. So we do have in the Aurora charged particles coming into the upper atmosphere. That's what's causing the aurora. So you've got very fast electrons uh, accelerated down magnetic field lines into the upper atmosphere. So they're hitting up at about 100 kilometers high and higher, hundreds of kilometers more. So it's quite a long way from where we are. In fact, the atmosphere is our protection. So it's not dangerous when you're watching it. However, sometimes you have you have uh, events where there's much higher activity. So something called a coronal mass ejection can happen on the sun. The sun fires out this huge blob of plasma. And, and when this hits the Earth, if it hits the Earth, then it, it just really puts a whole lot more energy into the magnetic environment, which is called the magnetosphere. And so it accelerates a lot more particles in. So during these events where there's much higher activity, then there is a higher exposure risk for people up in the atmosphere. So, for example, pilots or um, or astronauts, actually, on the International Space Station. So people like NASA have to be careful. Uh, they they actually talk to the, the Space Weather Prediction Center every day to find out about the space weather environment so they can protect their astronauts. And in the case of a really big event, uh, then it may be that the airplanes can't fly across the poles because it would give too much exposure and this is cumulative exposure so for pilots and, st and crew who are flying a lot it's not dangerous if you happen to be in an airplane watching an auroral display i've done that too it's lovely <laughs> yes I, i've recently watched some great footage by nasa that shows satellite footage just orbiting the earth 
and you can see the these solar storms, and they're absolutely incredible. Mm. But they're like on the outside of the globe, right? Yeah. From our perspective, it looks like they're just in the sky, but they're actually quite a bit farther, I think, than they appear. Yeah, I, I really like those International Space Station uh, videos because they give you a real sense of perspective because the, the aurora are high up. So, as I said, they're about they're starting at maybe 80 to 90 kilometers above the Earth and they stretch hundreds of kilometers more. And you see that in these videos because you see that there's a gap between the surface of the Earth and where the aurora starts. And you see that there's this this you know big curtain of color stretching up. So you, you do get an impression of, of the height, which is nice because when you see it from the ground, I think it can be hard to, to know that. And in fact, that was a, a big research area in the early 1900s because they just didn't know how high the aurora were and there are old stories you know like indigenous people like the Sami's stories of um of the aurora burning people's hair and and things like that and they say that if you tease the aurora they'll come down and get you and it sometimes looks like the aurora can come really close to us but actually they can't they're about 100 kilometers up above us i grew up in alberta and sometimes when you get quite north uh, they're absolutely amazing and they're just dancing all over the sky. It's not just a wisp. It's a light show. It's like a fireworks show. Oh, you're so lucky to, to to see that, and especially if you see it regularly, because I, I actually saw my best aurora displays just this year in Canada. I went up to Yellowknife and, and stayed in a lodge, Blatchford Lake Lodge, just outside of that. And it was just wonderful because for about six nights running, we saw Aurora and I saw it dancing like that for the first time. And even having written a book about it, I just hadn't seen the Aurora that well, even though I'd seen it several times. It had just always been fairly quiet and it just it's just chance, really. Like you have to be in the right place at the right time. The conditions have to be right. The weather has to be right. And if you live up somewhere like that, then you've got much, much more chance of of being in the right place at the right time. You know, when they're dancing like that, just as dancing is, it's like to music. It's just wonderful. I just, I love it. And it's kind of addictive. You just want to see it again. It's like it stops and you go, more, more, <laughs> do it again. I just love it. <laughs> do you ever get that and then get shooting stars behind it? Have you ever taken some great shots like that? I, I have actually sometimes. I'm not very good at the photography, um, although I did get some really nice ones in Canada this year. Uh, but in the, I definitely saw some shooting stars in Scotland last year when I was uh, trying to take pictures of the aurora. The, the aurora didn't make such a good appearance, but we definitely saw some shooting stars. So that's like a, an extra bonus. <laughs> so what did ancient man think of the Northern Lights? Is it written, you mentioned the natives, but how far back does it go? There is a cave um, down in, in southern France where there were pictures that that look a little bit like those wavy curtains of the aurora, like that we were just talking about from the uh, like the International Space Station, where it looks like curtains. And so we can't we can't say for sure whether they were, but uh, if they are, then they're probably like the earliest <laughs> aurora art <laughs> that exists. So people have been people have definitely been seeing this for a long time. And there are stories, so then uh, Sami and Inuit stories of the Aurora and, of course, Russians in Siberia as well, because all of these different cultures had their own either explanations for what caused the Aurora or also just they factored in their stories. They were just something that happens. It's just an, you know, almost an everyday occurrence. They just were, were woven into their ordinary stories. So there was a lot of... Yeah, folklore and uh, mysticism about the aurora. As they happen at the poles, does that have any correlation to the cold, the heat? Are they better in colder environments? I don't think there's any correlation with the, the heat as such. Um, the polar aspect of it is just the magnetic field. So it just turns out that the Earth's magnetic field is a bit like a bar magnet in space, and it's almost aligned with the uh, geographic axis of the Earth, but not quite. In fact, it's tilted slightly towards Canada. So it's if we have a bar magnet in the Earth and it's sort of, yeah, tilting a little bit towards Canada, which is another reason why you get really good northern light, because it's, it's slightly, uh, well, it doesn't happen exactly at the pole, the aurora. It happens in a ring around the poles. And so you see them further south relative to, say, Siberia on the other side of the planet 
because you've got the, the magnetic field in your favor. Uh, so that's why it happens at the poles. It's just because of the orientation of the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field were to move, say, in the future, because it does wiggle around, if it were to move to the equator, then you'd start seeing the aurora around there rather than up at the poles. Are the northern lights influenced by the Coriolis effect? Hmm. I don't know enough about that. I think that some of the particle flows are because there are like flows in the atmosphere and uh, and currents that occur because of these particles all moving around and so you get some flows uh, which are just due to the way that the magnetic field is is all is changing when you're watching an aurora display you've actually got field lines opening on the sun side of the earth they're breaking apart they're being stretched out over at the top and the bottom of the earth and then they get sort of stretched out behind the earth into this sort of long tail of magnetic field and eventually it's this long tail it gets sort of more and more field lines piled up on it and it gets squashed together and that's what causes the catapulting acceleration process behind the earth which is what accelerates the uh, electrons into the atmosphere and causes the aurora so you've got all of these these movements of, of plasma on magnetic field lines and so this sets up currents, and so some some of these particle flows in the atmosphere uh, probably are affected by the Coriolis, Coriolis force, uh, Coriolis effect, sorry, as well. Um, but I'm afraid I don't know about the intricate interplay of that. Are there any other applications of the uh, aurora borealis? I mean, any, I could imagine how, but um, military applications or energy applications could we tap into it somehow? Is there anything practical? I currently don't know of anything practical uh, that comes out of the aurora. Uh, I don't I don't think there are any ways to harness the energy at the moment. There is a lot of energy up there, but it's very high up and it's very dispersed, very diffuse. Uh, so I don't know of any way that you could you could harness that. Um, so at the moment, no, I don't know of anything, anything practical uh, concerning the aurora. We just enjoy it. You had a great time writing this book, Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights. So you found them. That's great. I found them. <laughs> yeah. If, if you could do it all over again, would you still do it? Oh, God, yeah. It was one of the best things that I've ever done. I was I just loved it. As I said, I love I love traveling to those places. I met some really incredible people. I learned a lot. And I just I really love like the the combination of science and adventure or that sort of like edge of exploration i think that there's there's so much that we can learn from all these things and science in itself is, is an exploration so i think it's great to be able to to experience science in in the real world in the natural environment and uh, to explore as much as possible Melanie Windridge, thank you so much for being a guest on the program. The book is Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights. Melanie, can my audience ask you questions? Is there any way for them to contact you? Um, yeah, I have a website. So there's uh, an email address on the website. If people have questions, I suppose that's an easy way. Or um, how, how do people normally do it? Do people comment on your, on your videos or? Well, people will comment on the video, but if they have further interest and they want to go to your website, say, some people want to engage in social media. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. I'm M underscore Windridge on Twitter. I'm Dr. Melanie Windridge on Facebook. And I have a website as well, which is MelanieWindridge.co.uk. Melanie, thank you so much for your time. Great show. Thanks so much for being a guest on the program. You're welcome. It's a pleasure.